Okay, so let's get started everyone. Hello and thank you for taking the time out of your days to join us today for our webinar, um, where today we're going to be discussing the rise and significance of remote education. Um, today's webinar will be the first in a series of videos which we're going to produce and this particular episode is going to be more of a general introduction into the edtech space with some of our experts. My name is Frankie Mitten and I work out of the Data Art London office and I'll be the moderator for today's discussion. And here with me, I have my lovely panelists, as I'm sure you can see. Um, to avoid causing any offence, I'm gonna refrain from trying to pronounce their second names. <laughs> Firstly, we have Dimitri, uh, who's our managing director at Data Art. He set up the London office and has over 20 years experience in digital transformations across industries. Uh, give us a wave, Dimitri. <laughs> we next have Alex C. Um, he is the head of our EdTech practice here at Data Art, and he comes from a professional services background centered around education technology and startups. And then finally, Alex M, managing partner, who's leading the Data Art business in Europe out of our office in Switzerland. So thanks for joining us, guys. <laughs> Today's session will be live. Um, so for all of you that are watching, do send in your questions throughout. Um, and then hopefully we'll get some time to answer those at the end of the session. Um, but there will also be a version which um, will become available to you so you can watch it back later and share it with all your friends and family. Um, so kicking off our discussion, Dimitri, let's start with you. Um, as both a senior leader of a complex organization and a parent, what are your thoughts? As you, as you obviously saw just a few seconds ago. <laughs> So what are your thoughts around remote education today? Uh, I th some, some of those thoughts will have to be censored, I'm afraid. <laughs> uh, because I think, um, I think a lot of the people who have kids and uh, try, to, um, try to work full time um, at, the same, uh, at the same time in the same house uh, are really struggling at the moment. I think um, I think if we uh, if we try to look down to um, um, the reason why you would be um, why you would be struggling, it's uh, it's mostly down to the fact that we're used to the whole education concept to be linked with particular educational institutions. Uh, if you look um, if you look at younger kids, primary schools, you know, secondary schools, then you go with colleges, universities. If you move to uh, corporate education, then uh, you still have, if not institutions uh, within a company, then at least dedicated people who are responsible for uh, uh, for corporate education. Or if you look outside, you have business schools, you have post-grad schemes, the list goes on and on. The, the problem we have now with, uh, I think it's not just the fact that the education became remote, it's just suddenly the education now is a responsibility of people who, frankly speaking, have no idea how to do it. I'd be the first to admit, uh, despite having gone through school and university and MBA and God knows what else, and having teachers in my family going back a couple of generations, I'm horrible at it. If I was to be rated by Ofsted, I would probably get outrageous. And I think that's the core of the problem. It's not just the technology, just not, it's not just the fact that um, there are now tools that you have to um, master. It's the fact that you're no longer relying on professionals uh, or you're no longer relying on professionals who actually know how to use the tools. We're all people. I mean, how many teachers actually did use the uh, did use Zoom every day for a year or for a month? Well, maybe occasionally. So I think I think that's um, I, I think that's my main point. It's it's not the remoteness of the education. It's the fact that um, suddenly we are without support of the educational infrastructure and somehow it needs to be replicated with the technology, which is an interesting task and then a huge challenge. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that kind of leads us on quite nicely into another question, um, which we've got, um, which is when, you know, when we're thinking about remote education, 
there's really kind of two aspects to it. And the first one is around, you know, the technology that's needed to power online learning. But then the second one is kind of about, you know, like you said, it's not the normal school setup. So what we have to consider is how to restructure the curriculum and how to approach distributing educational materials through these technology platforms. So maybe you've already answered it, um, but which of these two elements do you think poses the biggest challenge for us today? Dimitri, we can start with you again. Yeah, <laughs> okay. okay. Um, the honest answer is, I don't know. Um, I think um, my, 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 my gut feeling is um, it prob probably either both or neither, because uh, I think, again, uh, because I've been in technology for such a long time, I, I don't really trust it. Uh, well, it's not, not, not actually a very good expression. I think, I think because I've been in technology for such a long time, um, I can see that uh, technology is still a tool and uh, it still relies on people. And uh, I think uh, quite controversially, I think the, the problem of solving the remote education conundrum is more in educating people who will be solving it. If you, I mean, if you look outside of education, um, there's lots of examples when um, uh, people build systems for a particular industry uh, and they think they know, but they come up with a with something which is not really fit for purpose because they've never worked in this industry. So I think it's important that uh, whatever technology is being used for the for the educational sector is actually built by people or with people who worked in this sector and understand what is needed. I don't know, Alex, both Alexes, what, what, what do you think? I would add a bit on this one. So to me, it sounds, I'm, again, I'm also biased towards technology because I'm in this space. And um, to me, it like when you got a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? So to me, the, the first instinctive reaction is to solve this, like, okay, let's, let's roll out another system and it will be there. But I've been following that sort of progression of the schools and institutions pushed online where you have no choice. And the sort of, if, if I got it right, the sort of initial feeling was, well, cool, finally we're going to have this remote distributed free of all these walls and everything, right? But then the second impression was like, hey, we've got this medium, which is, for example, Zoom or whatever video conferences you get or LMS. So we've got technology, but you cannot just take the existing processes, curriculum, materials, and whatever, and move it over to new medium, because the modalities are different, the ways to interact are different, even psychology is different. So the, if we talk about kids, it's a very different experience for them to sit, I don't know, a lecture or long somewhere at school, uh, or to sit like an actual long uh, next to their PC or device. And then if you multiply these by number of lectures and the fact that they're staying home all the time and everything, so it, it just sounds like the, the, the sort of the question is larger, larger than just technology or methodology, methodics. It's both because like to utilize the new technology, you need to have the new methods, new pedagogy for that one, right? Uh, taking into account all that psychological things. And um, you cannot solve one without another. So, I mean, they probably, I would see these going further and staying like these up to a point. So we were first in line, which is like, something out of our control. And likely uh, sustaining this regime for a while would, would put us into the position of staying with it after this is over. And so this will open up some new opportunities and new, new again, formats, new modalities, new, new ways to do the education online. But that would be something new. So there is, it has to be kind of implemented in some way. I, I, can, I can only side with Alex because I see that remote education is basically shows the flows of the current educational uh, uh, system is just better, better extend. Uh, first of all, I, I, I have much more exposure to what the, the kids are learning during the, the classes because I see that. I, I see actually 
much more, how it's structured. It's not necessarily all bad or, or all good. It's far from being that black and white picture. We see even recently before Corona that um, there was emphasis of self-managed work, uh, project-based work for, for students and, and children, different types of individual program and self-assessment tools. Um, but uh, the remote aspect just show that it's become more and more important for, for educational process to rely on those new uh, trends and new ways of, of working with the children as the teacher has less ability to control them in a the classroom and it's harder to engage them. You need to come up with the better tools, better structures, better instruments, and I believe technology can play a huge role in that, but definitely won't be a golden or silver bullet, uh, one golden standard for, for educational process. It's just we see very good stress tests and it demonstrates that we have definitely area for improvement. Great, thanks for those inputs. Um, this next question is actually um, mostly for you, Alex M. Um, but seeing as you're based out in looking at continental Europe, um, education systems between Germany and Switzerland and the UK are all very diverse. Um, but based on your experience, how do you feel continental Europe and the German speaking world is different in their approach to remote education? It's a very good question. Um, I, I think fundamentally there is not a huge difference. Um, um, we still have the same, the same approach. Um, I believe technology is actually started being embedded into the educational process quite early in, in Europe or earlier than in UK. For example, um, the kids in my school are issued with laptops uh, from the f day one. So it was not a big problem for them to do remote. And also the, the German culture actually have huge favor for self-assessment tools and different types of online tests, which I believe is a part of a culture. So it's actually quite presented in the educational process. Um, but I still believe uh, there's a lot of areas that are extremely conservative. Uh, I also believe that teachers um, probably would need to spend more time uh, in Europe for self-education. Uh, we, we have a day off at school when the teachers are going to their uh, educational upgrade courses. So I know how few those days they have a year. So we're usually talking about just a few days a year, they have a time to, to upgrade their skills, upgrade their knowledge or learn new technology. And that's, I believe, something that we see strong uh, mm, tendency in, in Europe to invest more and more in that area. Historically, educational system is, is changing with generation of teachers. With the tempo we currently have in the world, obviously it's, it's not enough. The teachers also need to learn through their um, life of, of, of being professional and learning together with their students. Providing them with those tools is something that is actively discussed in Europe. Um, it's definitely on the agenda. It was even before the crisis uh, with the, uh, the recent one. Uh, so I think there's definitely good trends, both in Germany and in, um, in Switzerland, uh, which we, we see as a very positive um, uh, movement. I, I strongly believe that uh, the, the recent outbreak is only is sort of speed up the whole process, make it faster. Thanks for that. Um, so moving away from kind of more of the traditional education that we've already discussed, <clears throat> the children say, um, let's discuss more about ongoing learning and corporate education. So organizations have to do a lot in terms of training and education in different ways, whether that's um, onboarding or suppliance or security training. Um, do you think um, we could start with Alex C on this one? Do you think that companies were already set up well enough digitally to be able to tackle the challenges that have been posed by this current pandemic? Yeah, that, that's a very interesting question. So, I mean, uh, the, the companies is a very broad term. So I think it was like all sorts of outcomes here, right? And um, the sort of percept, the, the gut feeling, as Beatrice says, is, is that the 
companies thought they have in place the sort of digital solution to this kind of, uh, well, uh, this kind of risk. So they, they've got the LMS, for example, the learning management system and some courses in there, lots of few people running it. Uh, but at the end of the day, what happened is in a matter of weeks, they were forced online. So if, if, if it wasn't built remote first, like if, if the parts of the process or the entire processes, and we're talking about many processes here, it's, it's onboarding, it's compliance trading, it's about the CPD and risk hidden within the organization. It's sometimes when we talk about account-based B2B stuff like data does, that's also account-specific training. So all these processes were done for locally, like offline. And uh, uh, the question is like, when, when this test happened, when, it, when, it, when you had entire organization with all the functions and processes get there, uh, it's, it's not entirely positive, I would say, right? So for the large organizations, large number of. At the same time, uh, I think that the sort of company uh, processes are offloaded a little at the moment because with the businesses, I mean, many businesses are freezing, many businesses are out of business now with this economy. So it's not that huge growth we're experiencing. So these processes are required to enable growth and, and adding more people. At the same time, um, the when you have this tool, uh, which is the digital learning and rescuing and, and whatever technology at the organization, plus the processes powering it, uh, you could be more agile because you could respond to market better because in order to, I don't know, cover the new niche or open up new markets or provide the new service, you need to train people into it somehow. It doesn't happen automatically. You can do it with the low level tech like Zoom, for example, right? But when you talk about scale and, uh, and, 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 uh, and you talk about distributed companies, which have different offices with different people's, people like we do, then you would need to have something a bit more high level. Um, yeah, I think so. What do you guys think? I can add just a few more, more thoughts, maybe a little bit in parallel. We all understand that in modern world, the education never stops, right? So it's not like we study in university, qualified as a, as a doctor, and then just working until the pension uh, kicks in. You know, the, the world is, is changing. Um, every five years we do some education, every 10 years we probably have some major change and some solid chunk of education to just keep up with the race. And it's happening pretty much across all the, um, all the, all the industries and all the, the works, work, workplaces. And if your workplace is not changing enough, most likely it will be automated in the next five, 10 years, right? So it's a strong yeah. indication that if you're not learning, it's not a good sign. It's not like you're blessed with the, with the stability of your position. So having the, the educational part, it should be nowadays embedded in the all working process. And when you, as Alex said, when we start a particular transformation, it should be planned and should be equipped with the necessary resources and time and technology to transform your workforce or your colleagues or your partners into the new paramount. Um, and basically trying to structure the whole uh, project with the keeping in mind that education is, is an essential part of any project. I believe that's a huge uh, shift in mindset in project planning, keeping in mind that people subconsciously know that it's necessarily, but it never was in the, in, in, in the face. This uh, last two months of remote part just emphasized the whole thing. They're just showing that people were learning by shadowing someone, now they cannot do. Right, it means that everything should be explicit, and that's something that we see, and I believe that's something many businesses should incorporate in their planning for the future. I think um, <clears throat> I think a lot of the companies, um, especially larger companies, already had um, the whole distributed education, remote education thing uh, embedded in in what they do. Because if you think about it, uh, if you're a large multinational and you are hiring uh, someone who needs to be interviewed by a number of people, and some of those interviews are done by Skype or Teams or, or Zoom, there you go, that's remote onboarding. You, you actually are doing it already. You just didn't, didn't notice that. I think, um, I think, I think the, um, um, actually, um, 
referring to Alex's uh, point uh, earlier that uh, there needs to be, um, there just needs to be um, an infrastructure, there needs to be a process that would consciously incorporate these things. And uh, the, the earlier the company starts um, basically documenting what they already do and making it into uh, something that is um, written in policies, and then um, scaled up and used across the entire company, the easier the whole process would be. Mind you, I don't think that uh, onboarding and the, the um, you know the, the current situation heralds the end of the office and everyone's going to be working remotely. I just don't believe in it. I think it would be. I mean, it, it, it would be hard, next to impossible. I mean, imagine. Imagine if you have to wear a face mask all the time, right? Your typical interactions are very much non-verbal. So if you smile at someone or, or you sort of say thank you, just mouth thank you, the other person would not notice that. And now try thinking back your typical day. Well, I mean, at least in the UK, your typical day, how many times you smile at people. Now wipe out all those smiles. You're not going to see them. How is that going to be? That would be awful. So I think the same thing is going to go for the um, for the face to face interaction. But the the remote aspect, the um, uh, the overall sort of technology based um, process facilitation, if you like, it's already there. And uh, if anything, the last couple of months showed that it, when companies really have no other choice, they start doing mm -hmm. it. So the earlier it's documented and uh, defined in simple terms, the better. Cool. Um, so, I mean, following on from that, does anyone here, maybe starting with Alex C again, can you give examples of where maybe from personal experience or professionally you've seen how this has worked well or maybe even where it hasn't worked so well in a, in a real example? that sort of transition, right, uh, to the remote. Yeah. So, I mean, um, I would probably give two. And the one is from my uh, uh, previous company. Before joining Data, I used to work for a small and work and own for a small uh, Logistify service shop. We had around 40 people. So at some point in time, we decided to actually, that we need to have that sort of uh, set of uh, learning materials for our engineers, uh, the source and software services. And we've prepared a couple of courses, which was a very natural process, like when everyone is excited. So we made this quite interactive with self-tests and, and some video bits and pieces and interactive content. And we started using it. So it was really good for maybe the first year or first, I don't know, uh, 11 months or so. At the end of the day, what we have found, speaking of the uh, outcomes, is that it's not just enough to, to, to to make the content, roll it out somewhere, and then put a, I don't know, the process sheet describing how this should be used. You need to actually spend resources on maintaining it, making it up to date, uh, getting the feedback and answering the feedback. And at that time, so when the kind of, the interest lowered by the time we, get, we started to get the feedback and the updates, we just didn't have the capacity to do that because we were busy with other stuff. So what we, the sort of a pitfall for us to was to roll out this, uh, uh, remote education solution or distributed education solution, uh, assuming that this, this is enough with this piece of content and, and, and courses and everything. But at the end of the day, you need to also have the time in mind, the timeline. And another good example is coming from data and that's about language learning. So we got this interesting function here in the company where we help engineers uh, upskill their language. And with all the like, like, lightning fast change which happened where everyone got online in a matter of a week for example right and offices got closed and everything uh the english learning process or rather language learning process continued with no disruption so within like four days the entire like process with english teachers materials mode people uh, everything it continued rolling as it were on zoom Partially because the, the, this was instilled in the process by the need to utilize the teachers across different offices. Because even before at data, you might have had a teacher 
who sits, I don't know, in V, for example, or London or whatever, and then they're underloaded with their current office. And at the same time, you have the need for them somewhere in, in other places like in Odessa. So they were already using bits and pieces of this remote. And it's just like final you know, pieces of the puzzle about the, like, I don't know, the control plane, making sure that everyone is up to date, what's going on, what are the assignments, when this happens, and voila, it worked. So that that's like two examples where it naturally came prepared for this. It went out well, and uh, where like we didn't anticipate the timeline, it didn't find out well. So what do you guys think? In terms of uh, in terms of examples, when uh, uh, when it goes well and uh, when it uh, when it doesn't, um, I think uh, I, I can I can give two. Um, one is uh, when um, when the whole thing didn't really work well. Um, friend of mine, um, his kids are in um, uh, in secondary school and uh, they they're doing the uh, sort of uh, I mean, they're not real exams, but kind of tests where you're using computer and uh, and the webcam. <laughs> and the uh, it, it just shows that uh, we underestimate our kids, and uh, we actually, uh, as, as as a generation who is supposed to teach, there's there's a long way for us because. Uh, the first part of the test is the kid is supposed to sort of show, use the web camera to show mm -hmm. his or her room around without, uh, um, to make sure uh, for the examiner that, uh, you know, that no books or, or, or notes or anything. And uh, that particular genius kid, I think, just put sticky notes on the screen of the laptop. And obviously the webcam doesn't see that. So it's all fine. It's brilliant, and then the the exam went perfectly, and <laughs> and it and it just shows that uh, it's not enough to um, use the same process uh, and just give it new tools. Uh, you actually have to reimagine the whole process and then look for tools, not the other way around. It's it's not the typical approach where you kind of come up with a solution and then you look for a problem is not does not really going to work here and then so so I, I promised another example where it actually did work the um um the uh, the, the way the way to um uh the way to facilitate um uh, corporate education um is um, you you basically need to demonstrate that uh, it's useful and uh, the one of the one of the things that uh, companies need to be very much uh, aware of is that there's a lot more security risk everyone's working at home people psychologically are in a different state of mind they don't see things they may be not as alert as they would be in the office i'm, I'm I'm not a psychologist, but I certainly can see that trait in, in myself. And um, the um, uh, the whole um, the whole thing um, about um, educating your employees about potential threats becomes really really important. So um, one of the things that um, we're, uh, we've done is uh, it just basically started sending fake phishing emails and uh, it, it, it because because of the whole gamification thing you know it kind of it's, it's it's kind of you know playing paintball boom you're dead well you're not actually but uh, you kind of think yeah well I, I might have done better so it's the same situation you, you need to make you need to make the result the goal really visible so if you do it then nothing would happen. But if you don't do it, this is the bad thing that's going to happen. And then, uh, yeah, so you you receive a phishing email. It's it's written in the best uh, sort of practices of uh, phishing emails. And you, without thinking, you click on the link, and there's a web page saying basically, boom, your laptop is taken over by a gang of uh, cyber criminals. So I think it, it's, it, but it, then again, it, it's it's just basically 
it, it just shows the same thing. It's important to understand that the, the process is first and then technology follows because technology is just an instrument. And it's important to understand why you're doing things before you actually start plucking tools from shelves and uh, start start assembling things. Definitely. Um, we've had a few questions which have been sent in by people who are watching, and I suppose one of them kind of carries on from what you were just saying, um, Dimitri, about phishing emails in a sense. Um, so someone would like to know um, how organizations can leverage education to gain a competitive edge. So what do you guys think? Alex M, do you want to start this one? Again, as I, as I say, for me, ed education is not something like we have at school, which is a full-time job for a corporate, right? So. Education is a central part of our operations and in many cases even conflicting with our day-to-day -day activities because I need to learn that, but I have something burning there, right? And it's always trade-off and a bit of excuse. Why should I learn German? Now, oh, okay, I need to send a couple of more important emails, that kind of, uh, kind of approach. And I believe it's, uh, in many cases, it's structured as a separate uh, unions or separate program and maybe even have a separate budget, but it should be definitely integrated in everything we do. Um, as we doing a lot of um, enterprise applications, I can give you interesting examples, which is correlate with, this, with the previous question. We build a sometimes complex uh, solution with a relatively complex user interface, which is a bit confusing and require some education for the people to start using it. And one way or traditional way is a, is a printing materials, you know, step by step, read that, read that. Or you can actually start using more gamification approach and starting with a, basically using the same software, but starting with very simple tasks and gradually uh, step by step improving um, the skills of the people and, and gradually increasing the complexity and uh, after three, two steps, the person actually start, start actively using uh, the software without even actually understanding that there was an education. So basically by structuring the, the process and engagement of, of your students, in that particular case, uh, users of the, of the solution, you bring them to the necessary level and that works much better than a traditional way let's put all of them in the conference room for, for a couple of hours and someone will bore them uh, to death with a PowerPoint presentation, which is, you know, our favorite sport. That, 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 that I believe, should be paramount shift in our mindset. Education is not separate. It's not separate activities. It's a part of our business uh, life and sometimes our private life, as the borderline between those two is actually hard to distinguish. So it, it should be part of us. We need to, to learn all the time and preferably enjoy it and have fun with that. I wanted a bit on top of that. Which we want to go. No, no. Yeah? Okay. So I would say that uh, the when we talk about the competitive edge and education, so as this might be the moment where organizations might use the education as an asset building tool, right? So it is already, and, and again, remote. So it's remote and education. So when you look at the person's skill sets, they actually might, might be viewed as assets, something they can do effectively and, and proficiently, that, that's an asset. And so in this view, the education is creating value for the person and for the organization. Now, when you, when you, when you are forced to do this remotely, it actually enables you to be global at that moment. So if, regardless of whether you're in just one city, like in London, for example, or if you're in, in two cities or distributed already, if you do have, it's easier than to keep on growing somewhere. So to me, it sounds like it opens doors to globality in a, in a, in a view, and then it opens door to the mindset where you view that sort of uh, interaction between the company and the employee as a mutual value building process, because it's already in there and everyone benefits from it. So it might be an opportunity at the end of the day. I think, um... I, I, I think I think it's important to uh, first think what is competitive edge, because um, if you if you look at uh, 
I mean, if you if you look at the textbook definition of competitive advantage, competitive edge, it's it's something that you have over your competition. So you're, it's something that you do better than your competition, or it's something that you do more cost efficiently than than your competition, or faster, or something better in in the wider sense. And I think um, I think it's important. Uh, again, like with a lot of other things, it's it's important first to understand what exactly you are trying to do before applying anything else. And uh, your um, your answer to that can be twofold, right? So on on on, on one hand, if you're educating um, your employees, if you're basically giving them new skills, it means they would be able, um, presumably, would be able to do their tasks better. I mean, why else would you? spend time educating them but also what is um, what is important to understand is very often a competitive advantage is something that you haven't really thought about before right uh, also sometimes competitive advantage is um, something that you didn't even think before is actually your competitive advantage so for example if your company has been built on uh, the fact that you just continue to hire the people that you like and and you kind of uh, sort of built the company ba based on that you might have not realized but in time of crisis if you're actually in a company of friends you're more likely to go through that as still a company of friends as opposed to just hiring people for just their practical skills. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating. I'm, I'm, I'm probably giving you a little bit of a sort of um, theoretical example, but I think it's, again, it's important to understand what are you trying to do and then think whether you need to continue educating your employees in just one particular area to give them better skills, or you might actually give them um, ability to educate themselves and just make it blatantly obvious that the company does encourage you to spend time on whatever you want to do. And education comes in what Alex M said earlier. I mean, it's a process. It's, it's not an event. And education comes in many different forms. You're reading a book and suddenly you have an idea about completely unrelated subject maybe you like painting and that allows you to uh, sort of free your mind from daily stress and uh, come up with uh, something again practical I think my advice would be how to get that competitive edge through education make it obvious to your employees that the company will support self-education We've actually just had another question in as well, which links to that. So someone has asked within their organization, what practical steps can they take to help build a more remote educational culture? Do you have any uh, practical steps that you could give, Dimitri? Practical steps, uh, uh, well, it seems, seems like I keep repeating the same thing, but uh, I, I actually, I got, uh, I got two, two points right first of all whether you realize it or not you are already having an education process in your company um, it just takes many different shapes and forms and and second just look at what you already have think about what is actually missing there and that will give you all the necessary information um, about practical steps uh, as in what tools you need to use, what kind of skills gap you need to feel. I imagine a situation, um, let's say, uh, let's say you're a multinational company and you are entering a new market and you need, um, you need your people to speak, well, I don't know, you need to see people to speak Dutch. And um, you, you, need, you need to set up language classes. How would you do that? How, how, well, how would you do that traditionally? You, you would, hire teachers right you would make sure people have time uh, you would make sure that they have the necessary textbooks and you would make sure that there are incentives within the company to uh, basically 
encourage those who would make great progress and not discourage those who wouldn't make great progress because you know some people would be able to learn language quickly and some wouldn't i, I certainly know that if i tried to learn dutch uh, i'd be exactly where i am now in 10 years I'm, i'm just not good with it so and and once you actually created that that plan you you will see what kind of tools you need and then 100% confidence that uh, everyone in the modern world already knows all the necessary tools. If you need remote connection, if you need video conferencing, there's plenty of that. If you need collaboration tools, there's plenty of that. You don't even need to go very far. You just need to Google it. So again, first and foremost, you need to understand what is your goal and then everything else, all the practical steps would follow. I would add probably a bit on top of that, uh, Dublin Dmitry. Uh, so I would say that the practical steps, in in my view, would be the small steps. So whenever you can actually start from uh, making an inventory of what is there, and then listing out those materials, processes, interactions which were offline before, that would be a, a, good, a good move forward. Then you can actually enable that with, uh, with whatever low technology tooling you would have, like a video webinars and continuing the same sort of, if we talk about the one-on-one -on -one talk in, in onboarding flow with someone over Zoom or someone over Skype, that would be a good next thing. And only after think about the more complex systems and what are technology to onboard. Because like the goal is to not, to not disrupt the process. You want to make sure it, keeps going, even if, it's, if, even if it's not that effective as it used to be offline, then the next step would be to move it online first and then to use advanced technology because technology comes at a cost, unfortunately. It's never free. It's, it's always, you need to maintain it. You need to create it. You need to have people tend to it, which is natural, but it, it can give you an awesome value at the end of the day, right? So it's just about taking small steps towards the uh, like tool you need because otherwise you might just onboard the piece of tech which isn't solving much of your problems, but costs a lot. Okay, well, rounding this up, because it looks like we are running out of time. Um, it's been a really interesting discussion today. Um, so thank you, everyone that's watching. And also thank you to my wonderful panelists for being a part of it today. Um, as I mentioned earlier, today's webinar is the first of a series that we're going to be releasing around education technology. So please look out for when we publish the next day, um, where we'll be uncovering uh, more aspects of educational technology, more specific ones, different practical steps. Um, yeah, and if, like we've mentioned earlier, if you guys, the audience watching, have anything you really want to hear about, do please feel free to write to us and we'll be more than happy to discuss. So great. Stay tuned. Thank you, Frankie. Next time. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.